Welcome to our live stream. I'm here today with art prof teaching artist Lauren Welch and Deep D Menon. Today we are talking about how to sell your artwork as merch. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Deep D, when did you start selling your artwork as merch? I actually started selling my art as merch immediately after I graduated my undergrad program. It was truly just a result of me being super broke and not having a job and just wanting to do something that made me happy, but also hopefully generate some money. So I already had a bunch of stuff lying around that I was trying to get rid of. So I was like, why not just slap a you know dollar amount on it and see what happens? So that was my initial start into selling merch. But what about you, Lauren? How did you start? Yeah, Deep D, it's funny you mentioned that because for me, it was the exact same way. When you just got out of school, you are untested in the real world yet and you can't get those huge commissions generally right away. So having all of this artwork around the small stuff, I do art fairs in my community and my friends and family and people around would shell out five, ten, twenty dollars for the little drawings that I had. And so here we're looking at a lot of these marker drawings that you've been doing for a while, Lauren, and eventually this actually turned into, well, we've got this tutorial, <laughs> it turned into that, but also this annual bird calendar that you put out every year and you've done it long enough that people now anticipate your bird calendar. And in fact, I think you're working on one right now for 2021, right? I am. And I always save it until the last minute. I try to get it out by the holiday season so people can have it for the next year. And I believe this is the fourth one I've done. So it hasn't been too, too long, but enough to definitely generate a following. I know people that own all three and look forward to the next one. I've got a mailing list for it. So right now I'm actually putting together the short list of the birds this year and I need help deciding on them, especially if if you live in the New England area, New York area, you can help me pick out the birds for this year. Yeah, and so it's really confusing for me <laughs> in terms of merch, because here's the thing, I've never done merch before, which is why I'm so interested to hear about this. But DT, how do you decide what to do? Is it just, hey, I saw stickers, do you decide what to do with previous artwork or do you think about the merch and then make artwork for it? Like which way does it go? I think it depends on each person, but personally for me, I think I assessed kind of what I had already just lying around and also what stuff I made for myself that a lot of people showed interest in. Like I already had pins that I was selling and I already had these drawings of ugly heads that I made that people really liked. And I was like, okay, the pins I have that I make for myself, I might as well make a few more. It's something I do for fun and I might as well sell them. And for the ugly heads, I was like, these are kind of the perfect size for stickers and for tattoos. So for me, the natural thing, because I didn't have the time or energy to sit down and be like, okay, I'm gonna open an Etsy shop and I'm gonna be really business-minded and um, smart about everything. It was it was really just like, oh, I need some cash. I have this skill, let's see what happens. So that's how I went about it. Yellow Heart Studio is saying, Lauren loved your online exhibition, would love to know more about your cards other beautiful items you sell, how do you decide what's becoming a card and what's being sold as something else? Oh, thank you, Yellow Heart Studio. Thank you for checking out the show. I have a show, it's posted on my Instagram about where to find it. But to answer your other questions, yeah, so I have one line that's cards that is just all birds really i've done other things I've, I've drawn cats i've done dogs i've drawn landscapes all of that but the birds tend to be cards because they've really found a niche little market and they also become the calendars and sometime in the future i hope to make prints nice cotton rag paper prints eventually but then i also have a line of things that are I, I work on six by six and eight by 10 inch 
uh, illustration board. And these things I sell as originals rather than making prints of them because they're a little bit different. They're a little bit more painterly. So I just really compartmentalize things based on where the market is, I guess. Like the people that are going to spend $5 on something are more likely to do it on the objects that they recognize. And then there's like a higher dollar market for the more abstract kinds of things. Well, I'm wondering, Deep do you find yourself testing and seeing what people are reacting to and then you make more of that? Or how, how do you go about it? Because I sort of feel like what intimidates me about merch is just so many options. I don't know where I would start with that. So how have you sorted out what actual objects to bother with? Yeah, that's a really good question. I do think that using platforms like Instagram or things that already exist and you don't need money, like, you know, Etsy will take a percentage of your um, cut, but using something like Instagram and just posting, for example, my pins or um, for example, here, this was a part of one of my open studios and I just had um, a ton of pins lying around. So I was like, I'll just do a flash sale and sell them for five. And I wanted to see like, which of my pins sold the most and um, what did I get custom requests for and all of that. Um, so I think that is a good way to go about it. And also for stickers and stuff, I started putting stickers on packaging for like when I would sell my pins, I would put them in a box and I would put a sticker on the box as kind of like a stamp of approval from me. And then I started noticing that because people got one for free, um, they would buy with you know the pins two or three stickers as like a gift to give to somebody because I would sell them for like a dollar. So sometimes if you can afford it, it might be nice like as a packaging device to include a little something that's really cheap and easy for you to give them because they might like it so much that they'll be like, oh, I want more of that. It's almost like when you shop at a makeup store and they give you a little tiny sample of something and then you end up, you end up buying the whole thing. <laughs> we have a question from Ipque. This sounds how oh what's merch okay well to be clear merch is the short term for merchandise so merchandise is transforming your artwork into another object for example maybe you put it on a tote bag maybe it's a mug maybe you're making a sticker out of it i mean online now there's just so many options and it's very tricky like lauren do you tend to do stuff that's on demand or do you actually get all the cards printed in bulk and do that? Because I also feel like I don't know which is better. Is it better to get everything or do it on demand? What's your thought on that, Lauren? Yeah, it depends where you're at. If you are first starting, I would advise doing on demand because you don't know what is going to be popular. And the worst thing that can happen is buying bulk a ton of stuff and shelling out a bunch of cash right up front. And then nobody wants that specific design. And then you have all of this same print lying around in your house. And that's definitely happened to me. But so I would go through a company called Moo when I was first starting out with my cards because they have this thing where you can print, they call it infinite printing. So a lot of companies, what they'll have is a, a minimum amount of an individual design that you can print. It might be 20, it might be 50, 50 iterations of that one thing, 50 copies. But Moo, you can say, I want 20 or I want 50, but of all different designs. So then what you have are 50 or 20 different drawings, like a couple of each, and you can test those out to see which are really, um, which are really desirable to people. And then from there, when you're feeling a little bit more comfortable, you can buy in bulk, spend a fair amount of money in bulk, and then sell out from that inventory that you have. I do recommend keeping inventory over time. It will greatly help you if you plan on doing merch in the long run. And by the way, if you guys want to see Deep D make her pins, they're actually in the stop motion animation tutorial. So you can see a little bit about her process in that video. So let's talk about some other things. Like Neil is saying, how do you know when you're ready? Is there such a thing as ready? Or do you just start doing it little piece by piece? Deep D, what do you think? 
I think piece by piece makes the most sense. But I also think that one of the big indicators for me was when I started noticing that people were asking for my work, you know, like I was, I was used to in school doing trades and making things for people for free. But at a certain point, it got to a point where like, I didn't have things to give away, but people were asking or I'd be wearing pins on my denim jacket and people would be like, Oh, can I buy that? And I'd be like, yes, yes, you, you have money. I Yes, you can buy that. Um, so if people are showing interest, I think that's a really good sign that you're ready to sell merch because if you don't have a following or you haven't really like found something that people are interested in odds are just selling whatever isn't probably going to sell that well so you want to kind of gauge are there things that people are enjoying and really liking are you getting a lot of likes on one drawing on instagram because that might be something to start making prints of and you know but lauren how was your um you know how did you dip into finding when you were ready to sell merch I think it's, again, the same as you, Deep D, where there were people that were eventually telling me, oh, I really want this in this type of way. Oh, I really want this. Do you have some of this? And I keep a note in the back of my head how many times people have come up to me and said something like that. I think one of the biggest things I get is I do a lot of patterns and people have asked over and over and over, do you do textiles? Do you print textiles? I would love to buy these. That is something I would love to get into eventually, but there also is a thing that you have to think about where is it actually cost effective and time worth your time to produce those things. And that is, can be a huge barrier in starting out. So you want to find something that gives you very little overhead, both in terms of time and in terms of uh, money. Speaking of showing interest, Deep Deep, Blue Wolf Spirit would like to know, do you have a pin of the green cigarette guy? I saw this comment and I was laughing in my head because I don't know who the green cigarette guy is. And I feel like this is such a common thing in the art prop community where our community knows our artwork better than ourselves. So I don't think so. I don't know who this is, but if you want one blue, let me know and we can have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, some merch is easier to produce than others. For example, if you're making stickers, that's not so tricky. You upload the image, you order them, that's it. Now, Lauren, this was much more involved. This was a laser cut piece that you designed and then had produced as coasters. Can yes. you tell us about this process? Yes. So. This, there was a makerspace near where I lived that had a very affordable rate for using the materials there. And one of the things that they had there was a laser cutter. And a laser cutter can cut things much faster than a jigsaw or your hand can. So I saw some coasters that other people had done that were done with a laser cutter. And I was like, oh, I want to put my own spin on this. Oh, I want to try this. But there was a huge learning curve to it. And now that I understand how to use Illustrator and know where to buy my wood and how to make it a little bit better, I can I can do this and make it worth my while, but it was pretty tough to, to start out with. It was not worth my time. Sometimes you get a knack over time on how to do it and then it's you can continue doing it. I mean, you said, Lauren, that you had to do so many tests to yeah. figure out exactly how to make these. So this sounds pretty labor intensive, I think, compared to some of the other merch we're looking at today, right? Yes, but I do want to say now that the designs are done, I can basically print them forever. I have the file on my computer. These were hand drawn and then I ran them through Illustrator. And th so the mirroring was hand done too. And I can stain my wood all at once before sticking it in. So now it's really a formula that I can follow, but still come up with a really good result. Seven Angelic is saying, do you find any particular items do better than others or is it pretty even? What did you find, Deep Deep? It is interesting. I think it a lot of times depends on the venue. Like when I'm selling on Instagram, sometimes I think that um, images like uh, prints or my pins sell better, which are things that are priced a bit higher. But when I'm selling at a booth, sometimes the postcards or the things that are just like a dollar, two dollars sell a lot more because you have a flood of people coming by and it catches their eye and it's a dollar and they pick it up. And next thing you know, like, you know, you've had 20 people walk by, just pick things up and you're like, oh, wow, this is selling a lot better. Whereas on Instagram, I think people spend 
spending more time and often they're even like looking, you know, uh, especially looking to buy art or looking to buy a holiday calendar or something like that. So it really depends on venue. And I think that's something that you really have to keep in mind when you're selling who is your audience. Lauren, do you agree? <laughs> Definitely. There are certain demographics that you want to target. I saw a comment earlier on here about what your demographic was. And that is huge in figuring out in, in making sell, sales and making a profit off of things. So with my work at uh, art fairs, I try to hit ones that have maybe a rural backing or a nature backing people that do that have a lot of time to go bird watching they tend to be between 40 and 60 years old i found they'll buy a ton of cards but i find it much better for my calendars which are also birds to sell those through something like etsy because doing the holiday fair kind of stuff i mean one there's covid but two i want to stretch out the exposure time of when those calendars are available as much as possible and i can also get pre-orders because calendars are super specific and they don't really sell after january after the hol holiday season's over linda is asking will you be discussing print on demand we will because I don't know if you guys knew this, but we have Art Prof merch that you guys should check out. You can look at it. There's a merch shelf that's directly underneath the video. You guys can scroll through, but technically the store is on Teespring. So the way we have our merch store set up is it's basically shirts and stickers and they've been designed by all different people. Like this one was actually designed by my daughter when she was eight years old because Steve it looks just like me, doesn't it? I love it. I, it's my favorite piece of art prof merch because A, it's made by your daughter and B, it's uncanny. It looks just like you. <laughs> I actually get that grouchy professor face. I mean, I just don't understand. But it's fun because so many people contributed. Like for example, Deep D, you made these stickers of us and that was super fun, right? Because didn't Eloise commission these from you? Yeah, it was awesome. It was like a little art prof staff thing. She commissioned me to draw the stickers. I drew them. I did them as a secret and we like surprised the staff with them. And then one of our interns colored them for us, which was also really cool. Yeah, it's a totally a staff thing. And actually this blot, oh my God. I remember the day I had a tube of cadmium red and I was just making blots on it paper and it ended up being our logo so it's funny the way things turn out and lauren what do you think about your duck stick your goose sticker i mean it's oh awesome. I, I love it so much i want it on everything i think it was cat cat said that it should be on a shirt but i was like oh it has to be a red shirt you can't have like the weird cutout thing around it that duck on a red starry pattern shirt i would wear that in a heartbeat <laughs> And I'll tell you to this day, this is still my favorite drawing anybody has ever done of me. This drawing on the left, this was done by Jordan in 2016 when he was an intern. He just did this little sketch of me. And I loved it so much that I asked Victoria Lynn, who was an intern, to do the line art and to color it. So it's actually really fun when you have that collaborative nature. So Linda, to answer your question, I love print on demand because I don't have to shell out any money for this stuff. I just upload the image, people buy it on demand. I mean, it's totally passive income. Whereas Lauren, with your coasters, you were so hands-on. This is like click, click, upload, you're done. Now that said, that's not the whole thing. I mean, you certainly have to promote it as we are right now and tell people about it and that type of thing. But I love print on demand because it's just really, really easy to do. John Murph is asking, do you look at demographics and geography for your merchandise? Was that the question you were yeah, it was, talking it about, was. Lauren? Yeah. Okay, good. And Seven Angelic wants to know, did Jordan finish that warrior drawing of Lauren? He has not, but he will very, I'm very so soon. excited. <laughs> <laughs> it should be really fun. So Deep D, have you done print on demand or is everything really made by you for merch? For me, most of my stuff is really made by me, but I think I also have, I rely, uh, I don't really rely on my merch as a 
um, income source. It's more of like a supplementary thing. So I really enjoy making things and having it be a little tactile, but I do have these stickers and temporary tattoos I've made from those ugly heads that you're seeing on the screen. So those are the temp tattoos on three of my very kind friends who I slapped those on. Uh, actually one of those is my wrist. So two kind <laughs> friends and um, the stickers, which is so easy. I just, you know, it's similar to print on demand where you just upload the image, get a sticker sheet, cut them out mail it bing bang boom but i do find i wanted to go back to the demographic question actually because i did find that like how you also find what people like in that process you find which people like what um like these ugly head stickers it's very much like people my age and friends and youthful people that enjoy that but with my pins i found that uh, like kids, I mean, like a lot of kids like my ugly head stickers because they're so weird looking and they're like, ah, oh, this is crazy. I'm going to put it on my water bottle. But with my pins and my magnets, I found that a lot of um, moms of my friends really like those. And a lot of school teachers like those as like the magnets for their boards because they have like very clear emotions and they're a little bit more simple in their forms and they're easily readable. So that's not something that I would have thought of immediately when I was creating this. I was just making them for myself and then I just made them into merch. But it was really cool because then I was like, oh, okay, around the holidays, I should probably make more magnets because I know that people are buying gifts for their teachers and buying gifts for their parents and these make great things. So I think it is a lot of like trial and error, but um, it's a lot of fun in the process too. <laughs> Lauren, do you find that seasonal items do better as opposed to say, oh, I have these tattoos all year round, but just say, oh, they're available for one week. Does that help you or not? Oh man. I How do I put this? It is a lot of effort to put out seasonal items because it's you are working really hard to both promote and create that item at the same time. It does generate a ton of money, especially if people are expecting it. That's the big thing. Do people expect that you're going to make this? Are you going to be showing up at a certain place selling these items at a certain time of year? I really do think that it is best to have both though. You can't be pushing yourself so hard all the time to make these flash sale kind of events, but you do want to keep your name out there and your work out there and people remembering your work. So you want to balance. Well, Deep Deep, do you have flash sales or do you have a shop or do you do both? I do both. I, I only use my Instagram to sell online and I'm a big physical promoter. Like on the back of my phone, I have my sticker on there and I've had multiple below. So I, I've had this happen so much where I'm on the subway and I'm texting like this and someone will ask me where it's from and I'll be like, well, funny you ask. <laughs> and I have like 10 in my pocket, like ready to sell them. <laughs> um, but I do think that selling on Instagram and a community that you already have um, of people who want to support you is really like my way to go in general. Well, we're looking at a t-shirt that was made by Tamara Miller, who is currently a RISD student. And I actually ended up buying a whole bunch of her shirts because I took my daughter clothes shopping one day and she hated everything at the store. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And so Tamara had this one t-shirt that had maggot pizza on it. My daughter took one look at it. Yeah, that's what I want. So I just ordered all these shirts from her. And I have to say the other thing about merch, the other side of it, I love supporting another artist. Like I'd much rather my money go to an independent artist who's working hard and putting their stuff into it than to buy a bunch of shirts at Target. It just, it's such a personal thing. Like I actually called up a student last week because I really needed a new bag. And I remember he had made these like hand sewed bags and they were online and I was like, oh, I want one. So I just feel like supporting other artists is a nice thing. What do you think, Lauren? Oh yeah, I mean, I remember that you got a calendar from me for your mom, I think, and that was the sweetest thing ever. I was like, oh my God. Oh. I Yes, I think especially I feel like a lot of times artists are in their own little world and especially in, in my field or maybe even Deep D's field, there's this idea that we live in this high power, high dollar kind of area of the art world. And so, but your friends and your family and the people around you still want to be able to support you and still want to show you that you're valuable to them. And so they, 
you want to have items that that they can purchase as well. It, it's kind of this respect thing. It's this acknowledgement that you want to share your art with all kinds of people, not just the ones that have thousands of dollars. Raw Nook is asking, is there such a thing as a merch designer? Deep, do you have an answer for that? That's interesting. I um I have never heard of a merch designer, but I do like I've in the past been asked to design like a t-shirt for a band, you know, so that in a sense could be a merch designer, but that's like a totally different um, you know, that's client base and you have to think about what they want and stuff. So sometimes I find it more fun to make my own merch because I can just go nuts. But I'm sure that merch designers are a thing. I think they're just called graphic designers, right? Lauren, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like graphic design to me. I, I don't know. I sometimes I see the stuff on on like Society6 or Redbubble or there was this thing, there was this uh, t-shirt company a while back. I forget what it was called, but the best designs would get printed for a certain amount of time. You could get these exclusive t-shirts. I was like, wow, that's really cool. I wish I had those skills. So people, there's some people that definitely have a knack for it. Like that's their thing. Mm -hmm. I, oh, sorry. I also just wanted to really quickly note the thing that Lauren was saying about like, and you, Clara, were saying about supporting other artists. I feel like on Instagram and on social media, a lot of times I'll find artists that I really love and I just want to show appreciation. I'll buy their art and it actually creates a friendship. Like, and that's happened with me too, where I've had, like, I have so many people follow me on Instagram and I don't pay attention sometimes, but then, you know, when you reach out and you send a message or you buy some of your art, you form this like lovely connection and then you become like mutual supporters of each other's work. I've had that so many times with animators that I like, and I buy like a cell of their animation or, you know, just ask them a question or, you know, support them in some way. And then they somehow discover my work. And now we're like buddies. And that's a great way in the artistic community to like, you know, put your money to supporting other artists, but also creating friends and creating community, which I know in art prof, we're constantly like, it's the most important thing to have a really good community. So I think that's really smart too. And I think, what you should think about is that when you buy something from an artist, it's not just a transaction. You're showing appreciation for that artist. And I think we all know how good that feels when it happens. Linda is asking for print on demand. Do you upload photos or computer generated images? You can do it any way you want. I mean, it depends on the company. There's some companies for example, if it's just a black and white t-shirt, they charge a lot less, if it's just line art. And so I think what's important to do if you do print on demand is you have to thoroughly research all of their specs. Like they'll say, oh, this image has to be this number of pixels, this is the DPI. So you have to make sure that you're really paying attention to those things. Although Teespring, the one that we use for the Art Prof merch, I really like their setup because it just says good, bad. Like it just tells you because when you try to resize the picture on the t-shirt, once you size it too big, it'll tell you when that's too much. So I'll tell you, I'm impressed by a lot of these companies. They just have made it so easy for a lot of people. We have a question from Kane Feathermore. Is there a link for the Art Prof print on demand store or should I just search for it? You know what? If you just go underneath this video, you will see all of our stickers. And if you click on those, that will take you to the store. So yeah, you can look that up. And let's see what other people are talking about. Kate says, last year I made a business selling jewelry and Christmas ornaments at a local fair. I'll have to start production soon, but I'd also love to sell my art. Is that too much to take on by a student? Lauren, what do you think? I think you can do both, but you want to, it, it's less about selling your art versus having a, a jewelry business. It's how many things are you trying to sell? You see restaurants out there that are really awesome, but they have only a few things on their menu and they do those few things really, really well. So that would be more where I would steer you, pick a few jewelry things that you know how to make, that you know can do well, and then you can spend that extra time trying to figure out how to market your artwork. And also these things generally, at least in my experience, are two separate 
venues, the things that you would sell at a craft fair or on your Etsy are different from say, uh, fine art, other stuff, depending on what your art is. There's a craft market and then there is a art market. I'm using these words very generally, but that's just the perception that's out there. I mean, Deepthi, would you say that in general, merch tends to be on the less expensive side, say compared to if you sell an original drawing or something like that? That seems to be my impression, but I could be wrong. What do you think, Deepthi? Yeah, most definitely. I think merch tends to be something that is on the more affordable side. And a lot of times it doubles as promotion for the artist as well. Like what we're seeing on the screen here has the artist's name on it. My sticker also has like a little tag of my name. So I do think it tends to be on the cheaper side. And a lot of times merch, I think, acts as great holiday gifts or gifts for friends or just or things to give other people or have because you appreciate an artist rather than something that you're like, you know, you're going to spend six months really saving up for something. And or like you've done a lot of research, you have a huge white wall in your new mansion and you want to cover it like that doesn't feel like merch would go on that white wall. That feels like something, you know, maybe that could actually be really cool if it's a bunch of merch. But I think there's a there is is a difference, and I think it it tends to be cheaper because the audience and the um, intent for merch is a little bit different than an original painting or a sculpture. Yeah, I would add on to that by by cheaper deep D, What what is your price range? I think mine is between one and fifty to one and a hundred dollars. Mostly lower than fifty though. Yeah, one to 50 um, is, is generally, you know, what I sell. Like a tote bag might be a hand uh, painted tote bag, which I do sell as merch because I like to handmade things might be, you know, $30 or something like that. But um, a, a pin might be, a clay pin might be 20, but a sticker might be a dollar or like a clay pin that was a mistake one might be five, you know, so there's a, there's a range, but I, I wouldn't sell merch for more than I think $50 for my stuff. Yeah. We have a comment from David, who apparently is not a fan of Printful for on-demand printing. Well, Lauren, I think that brings up a good question because there's so many platforms. Do you use yeah. Vistaprint? Is it Modern Postcard? Is it Moo? Is it Spoonflower? Like, how do you figure out which one to use? Oh man, this is so hard and it's so intimidating. I really feel for anyone that's first trying this out because there are so many different things and you don't want to put all your money towards something that's not going to work out. I mean, the ones that I have used, I actually quite like Vistaprint. I think sometimes it's got a weird, like a weird aura to it, but it will have these giant sales and I've done, what do you call it? Product tests where you show a person two products that were made by different companies that are like the same thing and they choose which one they like better and actually more people like my vista print prints than my moo ones even though moo is three to four times as expensive so i i would test between multiple companies on that and do like a five dollar ten dollar transaction for each one and then ask people which they like I also think asking people who do similar work that you like, like if you've bought a print and you're like, oh, this is really nice quality, where they produce their work is a really simple way of doing it. Because um, a lot of times there are people who have been doing this for a lot longer than you have, and they might have some insight on like what is uh, worth the money and what is not. Yeah. Tammy is saying, I want to create a card to raise money to help a cause. Well, DP, you did something similar where you participated in a fundraiser. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, um, one of the two times I've ever tabled was um, at an event for reproductive justice, and we donated 20% of our um, profits to Planned Parenthood, I believe it was. Um, so that was really great. And it was organized just by someone who had a space available, found some artists who made um, work that she liked and thought worked well together. And I was one of them and then um, just put us all together. And there was a small tabling fee, I think of $25 that also went towards the cause, but um, it was really awesome. And I do think that it worked really well and it was a really low stakes 
effort because a lot of us already just had work ready to be sold. Um, and it was something that a lot of people wanted to do. So I think just marketing it really well. I think um, having a space that works or if you're doing it online, you know, maybe creating an Instagram for the event itself um, and a Facebook page for the event itself and really promoting it, choosing artists who maybe already have a following. For example, if you're making work on reproductive justice, perhaps um, women who make work about reproductive justice or the body or, or just, you know, people who are passionate about the cause and are willing to talk about it. You don't want to have artists in your thing who are just like have no online presence and won't bring any traffic like that. Maybe they will. But, you, you, you know, if it's your first time hosting an event like this, it might be good to try and get artists who can also bring traffic. So I think marketing is a huge part of it. And it's totally doable online. And um, the way ours worked was it was just an honor code. Like we just, you know, said that we would donate 20 percent of what we made. So it wasn't super strict. But I guess there's other ways to make sure that the money gets donated. But I think it's an awesome way. And a lot of times merch is the best thing to sell because it's cheap. A lot of people want to support you and they want to support a cause. So it will bring a ton of people. So I think that's awesome, Tammy. I hope you do participate in something like that. That'd be really cool. Seven Angelic is saying, what is a recommended markup from your costs? Great question. How do you determine that, Lauren? That's a really good question. It really depends on who who is making it. Is it you or is it a company? What Where is your audience? What is the price point of your audience and how you are selling it? Uh, so for some of my things, not all of my things, some of my things, I sell them wholesale, which means that a, a location, a brick and mortar shop will, will buy a whole bunch of them, but will buy them for half, half the price that they will then sell them in the store. Kind of like the way that a gallery runs where they'll take a 50% cut of the thing that you do. This is really common. A lot of vendors have to do this when they're selling to a brick and mortar place. So I want to at least be able to make a profit off of that half price after factoring in all of my, all of my costs to actually make the work. So I factor in that, I factor in my time, I factor in how much I can sell. If I'm selling something in bulk, you know, my profit can be pretty, pretty small. I can, if I, if I get a dollar per card with the wholesale, then that, that works fine. If I'm selling, you know, hundred cards or something like that, that's really easy. So it's really case by case, I'd say. Mr. Umbra is saying, if we can produce a design for a product, but we can't make the actual product itself, what would you recommend? Thoughts, Deep Deep? Well, it depends on what that product is, you know, um, but for example, if it's like making a calendar or if it's making a hat or something, um, I think doing one of those websites that we've talked about that, you know, prints on demand for you might be perfect because you can produce the design, you can upload it, um, and then you can have the company create the product itself for you and sell it out and deal with all of that. So that's really great. And that's what all of the Art Prof merch that we were talking about earlier is. So, you know, we're a bunch of designers. So all of the work is a lot of ours and our communities, but um, we just upload it to Teespring, I think is the website, and then they take care of all of the actual manufacturing. So that might be the best avenue if you're thinking about, you know, hats, tote bags, cups, mugs, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Lauren, you got to tell everybody what this is because this is so cool what you made. Oh, uh, this is kind of crazy. Yeah. So you guys know, some of you know that my dad is a mail artist, postal artist. I feel like I'm mentioning this a lot these days. So one of the things that we have, a few of the things that we have, one, we have a perforator, which is a really cool machine that's used to make the tear lines for the stamps. It creates little chads, perforations. And then the other thing that we have are two old fashioned stamp machines where you stick in a bunch of quarters and out pops a little booklet of stamps. So I basically, oh, we also got, you can buy gummed paper online, which is paper that you lick and it will stick onto something. So I printed a bunch of my popular drawings, I guess, and then perforated them and uh, tore them up into little booklets and then had this, I think I had it for one or two dollars and I had this at craft fairs, doesn't really work in 
a website selling from a website because people are really paying for the experience. The the stamps really don't cost anything to make and they don't, you can't use them on an envelope, but people love the experience like putting money in a gumball machine, sticking money into this old fashioned stamp machine, pressing it in, pressing that button and out pops a little stamp booklet with surprise <laughs> forms because they're all different. So having an experiential element to your craft table really adds to the engagement and gets people hooked on the rest of the things that you're selling. Yeah, I actually once at a craft table at the Reproductive Justice one sold like pre-made postcards for a dollar or I would like draw someone a postcard based on like a word or something really quickly for like five dollars. Um, and so many people wanted that. They're like, can you draw my dog in your style? Or can you draw my this in your style? And um, that was such a kick for me to do and for them to receive, which is a really cool idea. Yeah, anytime you can make it in front of them, it's always a great idea because people can't help themselves. They want to see what all the fuss is and it's super fun to do that. And there's we nothing like comment. it. Yes, and it's yeah. like totally original, you know, like they're like, nobody else has this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Johnny is asking, where do we go to find the merch you are showing? If you guys go underneath the video, we have a merch shelf on YouTube because YouTube and Teespring are actually connected. So that way you guys can always look at our merch underneath the videos. But of course, if you click on them, I believe it does take you to the Teespring store. So you guys can check that out. And we have a question from Yellow Heart Studio. Watercolor originals turn into prints. Which paper can convey texture and still print with quality? Tried some that look flat and artificial, like matte couche. I don't know what that is, but I'm assuming it's a type of paper. Lauren, do you have any suggestions for this? I do. Okay, best paper of all time is that cotton rag paper, and you want to print matte. I, oh man, there's a certain brand. I have used iprintfromhome.com, which is an online printing place, and I've gotten pretty good quality as long as I upload really good photos. But they're, it's one of their more expensive papers, but it's still affordable if you want to do five or 10 prints or whatever. And it comes out so luscious as if the watercolor or the painting has been done right on the paper. And it's the only cotton rag one they have. So I recommend going there and trying that. I mean, we probably will have a stream at some point that's just about how to make prints to sell. But Song Kang, who we were looking at earlier because she sells lots of merch like stickers and everything of her stuff, but she sells lots and lots of prints. And her piece of advice, which I thought was brilliant, she said that it's much better to get a local printer because then you can actually go into the shop. You can feel all the different paper types. You can look at proofs. And she said that actually, if you really are concerned about the quality of your prints, that having a relationship with a printer is actually very important because then they have an understanding of what are you looking for? Whereas you just ship it off to some random online store, you don't really have that relationship. So that was something that she recommended to me. Kate is asking, when you print through a company, do you have to edit the photo to be the correct brightness and saturation? Deep D, what do you think? Um, I think that yes, you do. So like you said, Claire, earlier, sometimes a website will kind of tell you like, hey, this looks like it's not going to um, print well, like I we they can already sense through their bots or algorithm or however it works. But I do think you want you don't want like a huge shadow on your photograph or you want to have like really nice, even lighting, especially if it's like a watercolor piece and it's not digitally done. If you're doing your work digitally, it helps because that's already a digital file, but you definitely want to have like nice, even lighting and photograph it as high quality as possible with the colors as true to um, what you want them to look like. And a lot of times the website will actually ask you to submit your work in like RGB color scale rather than CMYK, or they'll have specifics and say this size works the best. It needs to be this resolution, this many pixels. So um, definitely pay attention to all of that and make sure everything is as high resolution as possible. I do have a good hack for this as well, Deep D. Um, when you're doing your prints, make sure that your computer is at half brightness because that is more mm -hmm. reflective of what the work is actually going to come out like because the brightness is always going to make it look super brilliant and super pretty, but pigment is not going to act the same way as light. 
Wow. We have an art prof share today. Art prof share is when you guys create artwork in reaction to one of our videos. So the art prof share that we have today is from Nicoletta T. And Nicoletta T actually watched Eloise's tutorial on Coptic Stitch artist books. I was there to ask all the questions because I had no idea what Eloise was doing when I was watching her do it. And so Nicoletta talks about how the process of creating something with paper helps her let off steam after a long period of day job pressure. So she got her curved needles, wanted to create the sketchbook. And so she said the fabric-like textured collage papers were smaller than the cover paper, but she liked them a lot, used four of them to cover each side. Cover did not look nice from the inside, so they glued craft paper on top and for the finishing touch, Nicoletta used a ruler as a guide to achieve the hand-torn edges. So Deepti, what do you think? It's beautiful. Oh my goodness. I would buy this. Like it, it's, it's so lovely done and it's uh, lovely done. It's so beautifully done. And the precision in your stitches, and it, it just looks so well crafted. Like you really spend a lot of time. And I also love that you said that this was a way of letting off steam and it was kind of like a meditative process. And I love the prints you use because the prints are so calming and the patterns have sort of a meditative feeling to them. And the fact that it's stitched so nicely, it, it just feels really like relaxing to even look at. So I love that you brought that feeling of the process into the final piece. It's really great. I applaud you on, on it. And I hope you make more and maybe you sell them as merch. Whoa. <laughs> that is a thing, Vipti. I was going to say that a lot of people at these art fairs that I see, they make books, handmade books like this, and they'll sell them for $30 or $40 or something, depending on the size of it. And they sell so well because everybody wants their own original fancy sketchbook. So that I feel like this is this, like a new beginning for Nicoletta here. <laughs> Well, I find it addictive because the first time I did it, it was actually to test the tutorial because I had edited it, but I was like, I want to see if the tutorial actually works. So I sat down and I made the book from Eloise's tutorial. I was like, oh my God, it works. Like, I really did not think it was going to work because when Eloise was doing it, it looked so complicated. And I was like, I can't do this. How am I going to do it? But if you guys watch the tutorial and you slow it down and you go step by step, you will end up with a Coptic stitch artist book. I was sort of blown away by that, which is really weird because I'm the one making the tutorial. <laughs> but anyway, Nicoletta, you did such a great job. Your craftsmanship, excellent. Mm -hmm. Bookbinding is one of those things when the craftsmanship is bad, it's like really bad. Yeah. And I think yeah. you guys can see that the work here is impeccable. So great job. If you guys would like to submit for your own shout out here on one of our YouTube videos, go to artprof.org, click on tutorials. There is a purple button that says submit your art prof share. So you can submit the submission form and we will consider you for a shout out. Or if you want to just tag us on Instagram and use hashtag artprofshare, we love showing what you guys are making in our Instagram stories. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Deepti, Lorne, and I will be hanging out in the Artprof Discord in the post live streams channel so we can talk more merch and maybe we can send you guys some of the links to some of those sites that we mentioned that some of us have used in the past. So you guys can take a look at that and subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. Thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who make everything here possible. Thank you to everybody for all your questions, all your comments. You guys really enrich the dialogue here. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.